Uh, so yeah, the title of the talk is talking about salt transport modularity and concurrence for performance at scale, which is a mouthful of stuff. Basically, we're going to be talking about transport and concurrency and how that plays into salt. Uh, right there, there you go. There's your agenda. Interpret that, please, and then uh, there you go. I don't have to type so much. So, of course, to start with the transport stuff, we have to go back in time for some hit for a history lesson. So back in the days, in the beginning of SALT, there, it was basically just a remote execution engine. Back in the days, like 0607 days. Um, the state system didn't exist. The reactors didn't exist. It was basically just remote execution with some modules for some stuff. Um, so basically, you would log into the master, send some job to some number of minions. And it was, it was actually really awesome at that, because there were a couple other products on the market to do that. And they had all sorts of problems ranging from not working at all to destroying your world or all sorts of stuff. So it was awesome. And so at this point in time, and even to today, Salt's still using some ZeroMQ stuff. So before I can really start digging into that, let's talk a little bit about what ZeroMQ is. So here's from Wikipedia, what they say it is. It's a high performance asynchronous messaging library for distributed concurrent applications. If you go to ZeroMQ's page, they have an even longer explanation of what it is, which is ridiculous. It's talking about like cosmic rays from 1950s comic book people. I don't even know what they're talking about here. Somebody was on some serious drugs and they need to share when they wrote this stuff. So uh, basically, at, at the end of the day, what ZeroMQ is, is intending to do is try and make messaging easy. So if you want to start sending messages back in the day, you have to you know, make a socket, and now I have to serialize it and frame the messages and queue the messages. And there's lots of things you have to do. And that, that was annoying boilerplate code, so we kind of wrap it up. So if you wanted to go do like a pub sub sort of thing, this is kind of what it looks like in ZeroMQ. It's just four lines to get a publisher going, four lines to get a client going, done great, awesome. Right? And so basically, you have these contexts in ZeroMQ. You create sockets against those contexts. And then they have the, the sockets aren't really sockets in the way you would expect. What they are is a interface into a specific messaging paradigm. Right? So the pub sub world, when I do a send, it'll publish it to all the things. Um, so that works really well. So it ends up being very easy to do. Um, and you don't have too many problems. So you know, as you can see, pub sub. Easiest thing, four lines. So we can go to the next one here, if it works, here we go. So if you want to do some sort of request reply pattern, right, I need to send a message and get a response, you can do the same thing. It's a different, all, all, the only thing that changed here was just the socket type that you're sending it in. Everything else pretty much looks the same. Once again, four or five lines of code, no problem. So zero and Q, super duper easy. So we can, before we can talk about anything past that, we gotta see how, how the transport's kind of used in salt. So in this remote execution world, uh, the request kind of looks something like this. You'll go onto the master and you will publish some job, which will say like, hey, minion, go run a high state. Um, so then the minion will get that job and he'll have to go potentially go sign in with the master to go to start uh, getting the pillar and that sort of stuff. You know, do the, your handshake, do all the key exchange, that sort of stuff. Then we'll go grab the pillar so that we can use it for the state run that we're gonna do. Then we're gonna have to go probably go fetch some SLS files or config files or other things. Uh, and then once we're all done with that and we have our big return, we have to go ship that back to the master. So all this is done over ZeroMQ. Uh, so basically you can break up the transport layer in SALT into basically two categories of messages. There's master initiated messages, which are just the published stuff. Right? I need to publish it to some number of places, preferably with some sort of filtering so we don't send everything everywhere, although that's a different thing we'll get to later. Uh, and then these minion initiated requests, which are these request reply things for like, I need a pillar, I need a sign in, those sorts of things. So, so ZeroMQ, we've been using for a long, long time and, it's, and it got us off the ground, it was great. Um, but of course, with any library, there were problems. So in the beginning, we had some, some pretty small problems that some of them were, you know, Salt's fault, and some of them weren't. Uh, a common one back in the day was messages would sometimes get lost, ZeroMQ would just just lose a message somewhere in the middle. Uh, there were various bugs in ZeroMQ because of that. We found there were some bugs with how we were using ZeroMQ. Lots of weird little things. Um, that's more or less taken care of nowadays, except for other stuff. Um, broadcasts, uh, ZeroMQ historically didn't do any sort of server side, uh, publisher side filtering. So if you wanted to go publish a job, let's say that included like a file, a 1K file, you have to send it to every single minion that is connected to your master which is a bit of a problem when you have about 30,000 minions on the box and you're only targeting one because you'll send that published to every single box and nobody cares about it. Waste of bandwidth. 
Um, and, and that sort of stuff got picked up in zero MQ. They added filtering. We actually added that into salt so you can actually have the minions filter and they will only get the messages that, that they're destined for them. So at this point, like, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, things are easy, you know, stuff works. So we really don't have too many complaints at this point because we're off the ground, salt's still growing crazy fast and stuff's working enough that we're okay with it. Uh, once we got past this, we started running into more weirder problems. Um, so we found, I found, we found this huge memory leak in 0MQ in the publisher, which you guys may or may not have run into. Uh, basically, if you go connect on TCP to a publisher socket and disconnect, you will cause that publisher socket to leak 600 bytes. It's been open for years. 0MQ doesn't want to fix it. Don't know why. So we worked around it in Salt. So we just have a process manager that says when it runs out of memory, we'll kill it and restart it, which stinks, but... You know, it keeps working. Um, so, you know, you know, that one was kind of a weird one. We're not quite sure why ZeroMQ is being so hard with us on that one, but, you know, okay, maybe, maybe this is something that's really hard for them for some reason. So um, we've also run into some stuff in my talk last year. I talked a little bit about this auth storming problem that we have in Salt. So ZeroMQ in its, you know, attempt to make everything very simple, hit a lot of the socket state from you as the user. So you actually have no idea who's connected to you. You just know that you got a message and that maybe you should respond to that message. So the common problem we have in, in large scale salt masters is if the master gets really bogged down with sign in requests, for example, the minion may time out the request and then send another one. But that message is already in the queue on the master. So the master is basically just gonna take things off the queue, process it, put it back, but 0MQ knows that it's disconnected, so as soon as 0MQ gets it, it's like, yeah, thanks, salt, and then just drops the message on the floor, and so you just wasted all these CPU cycles doing nothing. Um, we never had these problems on small scale. I mean, small scale, anything up to a few thousand nodes, we never ever ran into this problem. But once you started getting big, problems. Um, and there's really no way to work around this. The closest we got is we got the minions to do some exponential back off, which works, the master doesn't die, but it does mean that to converge after that sort of event takes quite a while, depending on how you configure it and how many minions you have, and so that kind of sinks, stinks. Um, Zero MQ also, since it's an asynchronous library, they decided that asynchronous should be in all facets of the, of the word. So if you go create a client, like an event client, when you call connect, connect is not a blocking call. So you have no idea when the event client connects, which is all sorts of problems for race conditions all over. Uh, it was a common design pattern that we use the event system all over inside the core. So basically we would initialize an event listener, do something which would fire an event, and then wait for the event to come back. But we've found lots of places where the event would never come back because the listener wouldn't connect until after the event had been sent. But there's no way to work around this in 0MQ. Um, so what we do now is you put in a wait. You time and you hope that someone gives you a thing and if not, we sleep. It's, it's a terrible fix that everyone's done for race conditions, but it's still in there today. It's awesome. Um, and, and one of the other ones that kind of became a bigger issue last year is there's some people that really have the issue with the LGPL license in 0MQ. And so they, they want an alternative transport to get away from that. And there's really not a workaround to that because we can't really relicense it for reasons, which I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not gonna talk about it. So uh, at this point, we're really not sure if 0MQ is like helping or hurting. It seems, it, it's great because we're getting lots of stuff for free, but it's terrible because it's causing all sorts of pain. But only sometimes, and worse at other times than not. So, so you know, th there was this, this big thing last year and then leading up to last salt conf about like, we need to redo the transport. So the previous attempt was this rate stuff, which was talked about quite a bit at last salt conf. And here's the big blob from the docs. Basically, it's another attempt at making a messaging library to create, to provide some layer of abstraction without giving you all the socket stuff, but trying to, to, to be less of an abstraction, right? So, uh, so basically, rate, rate, rate had some good things. The big good thing that it has is that it's not zero MQ. So that's cool. We get a lot more socket stuff back. We control the library, so we can actually change things if there's problems with it. And if we don't like the abstraction, we can mess around with it. There's lots of options. Um, the, the, the bad things is rate, rate kind of had a couple problems as a project really from the get-go. We kind of tried to, it, it tried to do two massive architecture changes at once that were tightly coupled. So rate, um, if you looked in the code base, is effectively two things. We we're introducing one, a new transport, which is this UDP-based transport, and it's trying to introduce a concurrency model using IO flow, right? Which there was some talk about last year. I won't get into too many details about because we're not doing that. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, 
But basically, that caused some problems because um, the way it was implemented, it wasn't, we didn't, it wasn't making transport modular. It was basically just replacing the transport. But since we needed to be backwards compatible-ish, it was basically just re-implementing the minions on this IO flow model, which got confusing and had scale other, other concurrency and scale problems. And so that kind of made it a real bumpy road. And then the transition process was really difficult because the master couldn't listen to rate and zero MQ for the longest time. And so rate was kind of stuck in this limbo land of like, we really don't want zero MQ, but we really can't make this concurrency stuff work. And so we got kind of, it kind of got wedged right there and that's where it was at last all conf. Um, so and there's some other stuff changed there as well. Since it was UDP based, you know, the client is now listening, not connecting in, which people may or may not be okay with because that means you can actually attack a minion directly. You know, hopefully there's not bugs, but also firewall problems and stuff. You know, these are all sorts of things that we can sort through, but it was kind of a big change one shot without really, you know, modularizing it. So really the, the, the thought was, you know, maybe we should just kind of start over. Like what is it we're trying to do? What is it that we need? And let's kind of go from there. So if you go back to basics here, Salt is really just a platform for all sorts of stuff, right? There's modules for everything. There's modules for execution and for runners and for every everything in Salt. Like we do very little in Salt to force you to do something. It's basically just a big framework that takes some stuff, sends it somewhere else sometimes, and then does some stuff and sends it back. It's very, you know, you're only limited by your imagination. So really, like, why should the transport be any different? People have different requirements. For all I know, you've got some servers wired up in a closet somewhere with serial links or USB between them and no network. I mean, I don't know what you guys do. Um, so, you know, we, we really want to try and simplify the, we want to make a module system and there's some requirements around that. We want to make it easy enough that people can make one because one of the issues historically was all the transport stuff was just littered all around the code base. It's like zero MQ imported in like every file and you had to like copy paste the right block from the right place. Otherwise you get the wrong socket type is a mess, um, which we were already working on fixing, but you know, you consolidate it all down into a nice simple interface that people can implement. We wanted to have test coverage around what the module contract is. So if somebody were to write a new one, they don't have to know all the cases that they have to implement. They can just make a module and it magically gets tested, which is a cool thing. We want the master to be able to support multiple transports concurrently. This is extremely important for when you're trying to ramp from one to another, because that way you, you don't have to do a hard cut over all at once. But this also means that if you have a specific transport that you need for, let's say, like satellite links, maybe you need to do some weird UDP thing on satellite links because of the high latency, you don't, you don't have to cut everything over to that. You could potentially run two or three or four or N. Because um, there's, no really there's no real reason for us to tie you down because all it is is a way for the master to get a message to the minion. The rest of it, uh, we don't really care about, right? As long as the message gets there sometimes, we're happy. Um, and then we want to have a nice clear contract of the, the, the encryption and security as well. Because that was another thing with rate. We were also trying to introduce the elliptic curve crypto instead of the AES stuff, which was a whole other mess in and of itself. You know, just too much change all in once. So um, the, the, the way we were trying to fix this before was with these channels. There was one channel for the rec thing sending back to the, the minion initiated requests. And so basically the plan, my plan was to just do that. Let's just finish that up. So basically we make two sets of channels. There's a rec channel that has a master side process which you can do some stuff pre so That way if you need to bind to a socket and then split the file descriptors, you're happy. Um, and post, but really from the minion side, it's just two methods. There's a send method, which just takes the thing that you gave it and sends it to the master. And there is a cryptid, tr cryptid transfer decode dict entry. Terrible name, we should really rename that. All it is is please send this blob of thing in a more private way. Because SALT by default has been using this uh, symmetric AES key for all the encryption around talking to everything. But pillars and, the, and things that are actually private are encrypted against the, uh, the key pair on the minion. So that way they're private between the minion and the master. So the other people can't decrypt it. That's what this method does. It's a terrible name, but at least it, you know, it is clear which one does which. Um, and then the, the publisher side is an even easier thing. All you need to do is call something when you get a message. So it's just a callback mechanism. So you say, I would like to, you to call this method anytime you get a thing, and that's it. That's all we do. Um, so really, like the transport, oh, yeah. Um, we probably have time, yeah. If not, we'll stuck at the end. Um, 
Right, so, right, the, the, so the question is, should, wouldn't we want to use symmetric keys for performance reasons? Uh, yes, and that's actually why specifically in this guy, there's, no, no, this guy, that's why there's two methods. The send method, from Salt's perspective, send is allowed to be, is allowed to use a uh, symmetric key, because we're just saying it needs to be encrypted for people, so that people outside of the Salt cluster can't see it. This cryptid transfer decode dict entry is for things that are very private that only me and the other end are supposed to be able to see. So this way, if you want to go make a thing that always does asymmetric crypto, you can, but your, your, your minimum bar is this, this one has to be private, send doesn't have to be. So that's the kind of the, the clear definition of what is supposed to do what. Right. Um, here we go. So channels are basically responsible for serialization. So pretty, everything today uses message pack, so more message pack, it's awesome. Uh, encryption, so we're still using the AES stuff, no reason to redo that for now, and then targeting. So the published channels are responsible for actually doing the targeting. Now this is important because the different messaging platforms have different ways of keeping track of how to send messages to places. So ZeroMQ uses the filtering. In the TCP world, you might actually want to keep a table of which socket goes to which minion ID and that sort of thing. So this way we allow it, up, it's up to the tr uh, channel implementer to decide how they route the message. We just say, your contract is get this message to the person defined in the message. So not terribly complicated. So with that, it wouldn't be a modular system if we didn't make another one, so the, uh, an actual one in addition to the ZeroMQ one. So the TCP one is what most people are probably here to, to listen about. Sorry, it's not very magic. <laughs> um, the, the goal here was you know, we, we make it all uh, modular and then just make a simple one to do it. So the TCP channel it has a wire protocol that looks just like that. We just take the blob that you gave us message packet and put it on the wire. So maybe not a well-known fact, message pack is actually an iteratively um, serialized and deserialized format. So you actually don't need to put byte markers and stuff all around, it's in the format itself. So we can just, just message pack stuff directly to the wire, pull it off the other end, no magic. It's kind of nice. Um, the main advantages that we get over ZeroMQ using just TCP, one, TCP has been around for forever and we're still using it. Um, it's very stable, it's got a lot of, documentation around it and how to work with it and tune it and that sort of thing. Uh, but the big advantage that we get in SALT over ZeroMQ is that we got sockets back, which is awesome. Because we know when things disconnect or, or break or whatever, we get all that state back. So all the failure modes are significantly faster. Back in the ZeroMQ world, to determine that a minion is disconnected, that is defined as we sent a message and it timed out, maybe which uh, there's lots of reasons it could time out. Maybe the high watermark was hit. Maybe you know, the master was busy. Maybe the, who knows? So all of that, we just assume that we couldn't talk to it and we just close it and start again, which you know, causes problems. In this world, I can actually differentiate between uh, the master rejected my message, he's not there, or uh, he didn't authenticate me. You can get all those different message types back. Yeah. Oh, so the question is, this looks like it'll work for IPv4, how about IPv6? So this, uh, because it says header here, so this header thing is probably misleading now that you're saying that. This is not a TCP header, this is literally me writing the body of a message. So uh, in SALT, pretty much all the transport messages are just dictionaries of things. And so the body is the dictionary message and the header is basically just saying like which message ID this is and that's it. So we're just writing it onto the TCP stream. So it supports IPv4 and v6 just fine. Hopefully that answers the question. Cool. Um, yeah, so for all this stuff, there's, there's actually some documentation I wrote up on the TCP stuff. It's not that fancy, so there's not a lot of docs. Basically connect, throw some bytes on the wire. Stuff is great. Um, and if you wanna see how it looks, um, we get this nice uh, simple interface that I create a channel and then I send a thing on the channel and I get a thing back. It's pretty great. Um, you can pass in timeouts and retries and all that sort of thing, which is the same interface that we had before. Um, but as far as you, the user, are concerned, nothing's really changed. It's just better under the hood. Um, so as I was talking to some people about this yesterday, because um, I'd already finished my slide deck yesterday morning, you know, so early before the talk. Um, I was talking with some people about this and they, there was apparently some talk somewhere in the conference about maybe TCP is slower or worse or whatever. So I decided that I should actually go benchmark it. But the actual number that I was more interested in was this accuracy thing. So actually with ZeroMQ, if you guys have run at large, you'll notice that sometimes messages get lost. 
especially when you get bursts of messages. Zero MQ hits the high water mark and then just everything goes to crap because it'll just start dropping messages and not consuming the queue ever or not consuming it until it's finished the entire queue. It's kind of a mess. Um, so what I did is I wrote a quick little test, which all we do is just fire a thousand messages at once and then just see how many of them get through, right? So with zero MQ, uh, I sent a thousand and 171 of them got through which is terrible, that's 17% hit rate. Now you can do some tuning with messing with the high water marks and stuff, but the issue is once you hit that high water mark, it's locked up for quite a bit of time. So that stinks. In the TCP stuff, it's all of them because a thousand is not very many messages. So you know, there's that. So from my perspective, at this point, done. No, no benchmark needed because um, I can't handle that kind of failure rate. <laughs> Um, in our actual production, we see a smaller failure rate than that, or sorry, not in production, in our uh, stress test environment, we see a smaller failure rate, it's like two to 3%, but that's because we're not doing quite so many in, uh, in parallel. So, but since people wanna know, I did a benchmark real quick. So um, with a 15 byte message, that's basically just a command uh, token, that's it, that's the message, and the master returns false, zero MQ, takes about two, almost three milliseconds, uh, and you can do about uh, 2,200 QPS on a given M worker on the master. So one process on the master can do about 2,200 requests. Now, for some reason, the Python 0MQ client bindings are really slow. This required me to use five processes on the client side to get this number to max out the master worker. I don't know why yet. It's something in Python. I think they got a bug in their client. But number, we'll just say it's 2200. We'll just assume that there's a bug somewhere in the client. So on the TCP side, we hit about the same. So the latency is a little bit better. It's 2.3 instead of 2.9. And the throughput is slightly higher. Now for me, this is all within the margin of error. So like in my, from my mind, this is all the same. So it's not any slower. In some measures, it's faster. Um, so I figured we should go for bigger messages. So let's say we're gonna send a thousand byte message, which is the same message with another field full of a thousand bytes. It was a pretty good test. Um, so zero and two gets about the same throughput numbers, about 2400 this time. The latency is about the same. Uh, TCP, the latency was about the same as the previous one and the throughputs about 2600. So you see these are, these are pretty close to within about five or 10% of each other. So. Yeah, I'm gonna call that good enough because there's so much other stuff with the crypto and all that stuff. This is probably close enough because these are really tiny messages, so measuring the overhead. So at this point, you know, the TCP stuff is just as fast, maybe even faster, question mark. Uh, not all the copying and that sort of thing. Plus we get all the nice failure modes that we want. Um, so it's awesome. Um, but some of you may be thinking, what was that whole async stuff? Like that line before with the yield and async stuff? That was weird looking maybe, maybe. No, everyone thought that was cool, great. The rest of the talk is done. Um, <laughs> oh, whoa. Can't do that. Um, so but before we get into the specifics about what all that async and yielding stuff was, let's kind of take a step back and talk about concurrency. So we'll like set the transport stuff aside and we'll talk about concurrency for a little bit here. So concurrency, the general problem is basically we have a lot of things to do, some of which are blocking calls or stuff that's really slow and it's more efficient if we let this, the processor do other stuff while we wait for that stuff that's really slow. So the, the picture that I've always seen in, in uh, presentations is this guy off some guy's blog on the internet. Um, you know, stuff is not as close as you'd think. Right? For, for whatever reason, it's a common thing that people think that disks are fast and disks are really slow. Uh, network is, is actually faster in some sense, but there's a lot of things that we do in programming in general that are slow. And the CPU is just sitting there waiting because CPUs go so fast nowadays that you know, all this stuff is just so far away. So it, it's kind of silly to make uh, the processor just sit there and idle waiting for this sort of stuff. So the way this is fixed in the concurrency world is we try and say, okay, I'm gonna do this thing, which is gonna take a long time, so we'll set that aside, we'll do something else. And then you know, keep doing that until you can come back to it. That way we can better utilize the processor. Hopefully everybody's kind of on the page, same page there. Yeah, noddings, everyone's falling asleep. Okay, okay. so um, how does this look inside of SALT? Um, so SALT uh, on the master side has these mWorker processes, which you guys may or may not have seen. There's a bunch of them because we need to use more than one processor. Now, the reason why there's processes, not threads, is a Python thing. Who here has heard of the gill in Python? Yeah, who here loves the gill? Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, the, the gill is an interesting uh, byproduct of how they implemented C Python. Basically, you can't have more than one bytecode executing in a given uh, 
process for Python. It's all based on the implementation. You can switch over to Iron Python or like some PyPy stuff and get rid of it, but it is messy with some of those guys. Some of those maybe someday will fix it, but CPython, they pretty much decided that they'll never do that. Um, so that means that threads are a little bit wonky in Python because they don't really run in parallel, but they're fine for blocking tasks. Um, so that's a high level what the gill stuff is. So on the, on the master, since we need to use all these processes, we basically fork out a bunch of M workers to use up all the processors, and we just get jobs and we do the jobs. So the way they work right now, or before, slash right now, uh, they get a job, they'll run the job, and send the return back. The issue is, is if you have something in the middle there, maybe like an ext pillar or something like that, which is gonna go make a network call or a file service through S3, um, that ma master worker process is blocked that entire time, just waiting for the 100 milliseconds or whatever for S3 to come back to you so you can hand it back to the guy. That whole 100 milliseconds, you could have been doing stuff, and you did nothing instead. And we like to do stuff instead of nothing. Um, and on the minion side, we have uh, some of the problems with some of this multi-minion stuff which people have been using maybe, uh, some people have been using. Basically, we want a minion to be able to connect to a bunch of masters, but trying to keep track of all those connections in a single process uh, has basically just been done using threads, which is kind of a mess. So we now have multi-processing and we've got threads. So that's always great for projects, mixing, forking, and threading. Um, I see, see, the QA people in the back. <laughs> Yeah, that causes problems, but you know, we'll, we'll just assume that there weren't problems with that. So the actual problems with concurrency is that there's just there's no unified approach to how we do this concurrency. Like we've got stuff all over creation. There's multi-processing, there's threading. A common pattern you've probably seen around the code base is like while true, call some non-blocking thing and sleep and then call it again and sleep. Um, there's, it's kind of a mess really because we didn't really have a good concurrency model that you should be using. Um, th so this means that all these slow, non -block the slow or blocking operations, we really don't have a good way of not blocking the process. You can fire a thread if you want, but then you have to reap your thread and handle all the error conditions associated with it. Multiprocessing is its own problems. So um, yeah, and so basically this ends up limiting our scalability because we can only do one thing at a time and that's not great. So we're finally getting to the point where that's a, that's a problem, which is awesome. It's awesome that concurrency is a problem now. So. Um, Basically, there's uh, the three common solutions in Python, which we're using two of at the time, was threading, multiprocessing, and some sort of user space threads like coroutines or stackless threads or greenlets or something. So quickly, we'll kind of run through what those are. Um, so threading, you guys have probably seen some before here. I made some thing. It's a terrible example. Basically, you go create a thread, which will go do some stuff, and then you can call join on it. You'll wait for it to finish, and you're great. So threads get you some isolation, right? Like the stack is different, which is nice. The globals are still there, so you have to worry about locking potentially, which people always forget about because of the gill. Um, also with threading, since it's the gill, it's not actually running in parallel, so hopefully it blocks. Otherwise, you're now splitting all your time amongst these things. Uh, and and it's, it's all done through preemptive scheduling, which is the same as what the multiprocessing stuff does. So in case you don't know. So preemptive scheduling is effectively the processor or whatever the scheduler is will come in and say, you've run long enough, thanks. Sit over here while I get somebody else to go. So this is why you have to do all sorts of locks and whatnot inside of threaded applications and multi-process applications because if you want them touching the same memory space, there's no guarantee that they're the only one touching stuff in the middle. Um, and then the gill kind of makes that less of a problem most of the time, which is why people usually can get away with not putting locks, but please put locks. Um, so multiprocessing looks basically the same. Um, it's a little bit heavier, so instead of being a thread, we're in a whole process, um, and because of that, we have to do some pickling magic, which is always awesome. People love pickles. Um, I don't, in real life or in Python. Um, so uh, you, we create the process, we pickle the method that we're gonna send it to, all the arguments that go to it. So we have some limitations, meaning that all the arguments and functions that we're calling have to be pickleable, but besides that, we're, we're okay. Um, you, get, you get complete isolation because it's a copy on write memory space and so you can't muck around with the parent process's memory space, which is awesome. And you, you still get the preemptive scheduling, but it's expensive because we have to create processes and computers can only have so many PIDs because reasons. Um, so it's pretty clunky, but you know, that, that works. And so we use this, this is the way to get around the uh, GIL problem. So this is how you use more processors. So, the more, the more modern way, I guess, of doing this is some sort of user space threads, coroutines, stackless threads or something, so that you and user space can control what gets scheduled when, and you don't have to worry about all the overhead of a, a kernel thread or a kernel process. So you guys have probably seen at least one of these libraries, hopefully, right? So like gevent or stackless Python, greenlets, 
Tornado Twisted, Twisted's the older one, which you know people have probably seen some. So these are basically implemented in one of three different ways. There's either some sort of uh, green threads, which are um, like a monkey patch threads, basically, which gets you preempting stuff. Um, these ones are kind of like sadly kicked out of the, the mix for salt. Since, we have, since it requires monkey patching in a module-based module system, that's not really safe because if one module doesn't expect us to have monkey patched it, you cause all sorts of problems because, method, because methods won't return what they're expecting. So we're kind of out of those. So that kicks out G event and greenlets and that sort of stuff. Um, callbacks, which people have seen a lot. Like, if, if, has anyone here done JavaScript ever with callbacks? Yeah. Yeah. Did you guys like it? Was it awesome? Wonderful? Yeah, no. So, um, yeah, so I got this picture. We heard you like callbacks. Um, so that's, that's a common problem with callbacks is that they just become a mess because there's no stack, so you have no idea what the heck has happened or is going to happen or where we are in the code, um, let alone trying to understand what the code does when you're reading the code instead of when it crashes. So we, we don't really like those either, but those can work. Um, so the, the last one is this coroutine stuff, which people may or may not have heard of. So coroutines um, have been u in use in a while in Python. Tornado's been using them for a while. Uh, the new async I.O. in Python 3 is all coroutines, uh, basically a rip of what the Tornado guys have been doing for a while. Um, so to talk about coroutines, here's our friend Wikipedia again. Uh, basically, they're just subroutines for non-preemptive multitasking. Um, so before when we were talking about preemptive multitasking, it's the kernel or the scheduler decides you're done running, I'm going to take execution away from you and let somebody else go. In the coroutine world, it's specific, uh, explicit, yield of execution. So instead of somebody else telling me I can't run, I say, hey, I'm done running for now. I need to wait on this. Or you can schedule somebody else. Something so that the coroutine itself knows when it's yielding execution. So this gets us some cool things, which we'll get to later. But basically, this is kind of the future for Python concurrency stuff, since this is what async I is going to. Um, so how does a coroutine implemented, you might ask, because I'm sure everyone's itching to know. Um, basically, they're just generators. Uh, so in Python, you guys have probably used generators. And there's yield statements all over creation. So what we can do is just make a, th uh, a method that does some work, take some input, do some work, and yield the output. And then with generators, right, you can call next, but you can also call send on them. And send will send the thing in. So this first line here, input equals yield, will get the value from send and then do the work yield back the next thing. So when you call next, you'll get whatever the return was, which is cool. And so basically to implement coroutines, they're just wrap generators, which is kind of cool. So it's not all that magic under the hood. Um, so if you wanted to do something a little bit more complex, let's say you wanted to wait on something to complete or see something in the middle or just maybe yield execution in the middle because maybe you're doing some CPU intensive things. You could even do something like this, have lots of inputs and yields all over creation. This is also valid generator code, so that's cool. Well, except that do something doesn't exist, but somebody can implement that. Um, so how, what do Tornado coroutines look like? What they've done is basically just taken that generator stuff and put it all inside of a decorator. So you can just throw a nice little decorator on the top of your thing, and it does all the scheduling for you. So Tornado has its own I.O. loop that keeps track of what processes, what, what coroutines need to get run and that sort of thing. So in this particular one, right, we're saying you know, handle request. We're going to yield requ until request.get is done. Uh, which actually it's not requests, it's supposed to be client, whatever, until that thing is done. So what this means is that the generator will go and it'll say, okay, I'm going to call this method, which will return a future, which we'll talk about in just a second, which, uh, which is basically just a thing that'll be finished. And so we say, hey, IO loop, I'm done until this guy's done because I'm waiting on this guy. And so this way, the IO loop can actually schedule and interleave all these things at the same time and you can control when you yield execution. So uh, you get some isolation between the coroutines. Now you have a stack that's your own, like a thread. Um, you do also get nice stack tra back traces. So if you were to go raise some exception here, you actually get a stack. It's got more stuff in it than it should, but you got the stack, so that's nice. Um, you get the explicit yielding, which is kind of nice. So you don't have to worry about locking as much as long as it's between two yield statements. So anything between two yield statements, you are guaranteed to be the only one running in your process, which is a nice little benefit. So you don't have to do so much locking for little things. And so these are basically just light threads. They're just a pointer somewhere in the user space to just schedule some stuff to go. So, um, so as I mentioned, the future stuff is the way that this usually gets wrapped up. You create a library or a method that's going to return a future, and a future is just an object that is a thing that will get finished sometime in the future, hence the name future, 
which is it's way more confusing in the documentation than that, but that's what it is. Um, so th this just lets you have a method that returns immediately, which is an object that says when it'll be done, and you can go do work in the background on that. Um, and so this allows the callers to yield that future and then only get called once that future is complete. So this is a nice way of wrapping it all up. So if you want to look at something like this, if we want to have something that's a little bit more complex, let's say this guy calls out to something to check whether the user is authenticated. We can yield on that. And then once the authentication is completed, we can then check to see if they are. If they are not authenticated, we can just return and not do any more work. If they are, we can you know, go yield on more things, do more work and return. Um, so you, uh, so it looks pretty normal, stack traces, um, and you can easily chain these futures up in one given method. So if, for example, if save one were to raise an exception, you would get a backtrace that points you right here, which is awesome, because you know exactly what you've been doing and where you're going. It's, it's pretty easy to debug, um, except for when things go really, really bad, but we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, I had something else in here, but I don't remember what it was. All right, so, so, what is this Tornado stuff installed? Why, what is Tornado first up? Um, you guys have probably seen it as like a Python web server framework. That's its primary use, or at least what it was originally for. But it's also built up because of that, this entire async networking library stuff, all these coroutines and queues and locks and all sorts of things for all these coroutines. Um, and so why Tornado and not async IO, someone might ask somewhere. Um, well, the main reason is, is we need to support Python 2 and uh, async IO doesn't work in Python 2, so that's cool. It's 3, 4 plus only. Um, and we have some other weird language things because of that. Um, since async IO is in the core, they've actually changed the language some to support it. So as you noticed in the previous slide, I had a generator which called return in the generator, which somebody probably here is angry at me for putting in there because that doesn't work in Python 2, and you are right. You cannot return from a generator in Python 2, but you can in Python 3, so that's fun. So all these sorts of things we can kind of gloss over with with Tornado because you can just do it in Tornado, and it's basically a free compatibility library, plus you get all the other stuff for free, the locks and the queues and all those sorts of things. Um, so that's that. So if we go back to the transport interfaces, right, like the rec uh, channel, when you call send or cryptid transfer decode dict entry, the mouthful, um, they don't actually do the send right then. What they do is they return you a future which will complete when it's sent or we time it out or whatnot. So then you can decide whether you want to yield on it like this or whether you want to just let that go and eventually finish whenever it finishes. But it's up to you, the caller, to decide whether you want to wait on it or not. That's all up to you. Um, so now this line makes more sense, right? See, yield, it's great, wonderful. Um, so any questions on that? Otherwise we'll go into what we've done with this sort of stuff, which is some stuff. between coroutines and not? All right, so the question is, is there any real performance difference between Tornado and Python 2 or Python 3? Um, the answer is yes, there is some. It's actually faster in Python 3, but uh, a lot of people aren't running Python 3, so <laughs> that works. Um, it, it, the, the big advantage is in Python 3, since uh, async IO is in the core, they've actually added some stuff to the Python interpreter to make things more generator friendly. Uh, slash performant, but it's not a ton. It's about five ten percent. So it's you know it's it's some, and we'll get it whenever people finally move to Python three. But some of us are on older versions of Rel. Yeah. Right. So, uh, what do you mean by regularly? Like just in regular code or in a blocking way? Okay, so the question is, how do we deal with all these futures in like a traditional blocking method call, right? Yeah. So futures can be waited on, which is kind of a cool thing. So you can actually just call wait on the futures. But actually, I didn't put a slide in here, although maybe I should have. I actually made a wrapper inside of the salt utils async. There's actually a class where you can pass it an async library, and it will wrap all of the uh, async calls and do the waits for you. So it'll make sure that there's an IO loop there. It'll call wait on them. And so that way, we only have to implement it once and then you can call it from a non-blocking or a blocking way. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that's, that's okay, um, and th there's some talks, we're trying to figure out, I, I'm trying to figure out how to do it nicely, but you can actually make futures waitable, so you can actually just call wait on the future. We can get rid of that whole wrap thing, but that's hard. So, um, so what have we done with some of this concurrency stuff? So we actually now have a real concurrency model. We can actually use futures that include stuff like scheduling stuff in the future or waiting for things that are done instead of all these like wild trues and sleeps all over creation. 
Um, so now the multi-minion stuff, instead of having all those threads, there's basically just a coroutine per connection per channel that, that makes sure that they're connected. If one disconnects, it'll create another one, but it's all within a single process. Uh, the transport is all the TCP transport is built on top of this stuff. So is the ICP or IPC, IPC transport. So we can do all this concurrent networking in Python, which is not, nigh impossible previously, um, doing it with threads or process and that sort of thing. So, and of course, at this point, we've done it all, and there will never be any problems again, right? No concurrency problems, because they're the worst. Um, so really, there's concurrency problems. Um, so the, the, the big two common pitfalls of concurrency problems are race conditions, or memory collisions of some type, and deadlocks. And I'm sure no one has ever run into either of these problems. So uh, race conditions, we of course ran into this in SALT, although it was very obscure and uh, a major pain to debug for a while. Um, there was this weird problem in the reactor. Someone opened this issue, 23373, whoever they are. They had a reactor, which was doing some stuff and you know, used the minion ID in the SLS template. And sometimes it would be wrong or like for a completely different minion or something. And it was really weird. And we're like, what did you do? You user, obviously it's your fault. What did you do, <laughs> right? And so as we start digging into it, it turns out the underlying problem is that the, the, in the loader, when you, you know, call the dunder salt objects and all those sorts of things, they're not thread safe. We just inject them into the global namespace and the reactor was threaded. So that means that you now have multiple threads trying to write and read into those dictionaries all at the same time. And that doesn't work, let me tell you. <laughs> so uh, this kind of created a big problem for us because not only was it not thread safe, it's not coroutine safe, so it's not like we could just throw some coroutines and be good. So the solution to this was this thing that I called conveniently the context dict, which is a terrible name, but somewhat descriptive of what it is. So basically what this is, is I want, is a copy on write uh, dictionary that you can clone. So basically you create a dictionary that looks like any old dictionary and then if you want to go give it to some thread or some coroutine, you can call clone on it which will effectively just maintain a pointer to the parent and then anytime you need to write stuff, it'll write it to your copy, not the parent. That way you don't have to worry about locking and stuff between them. And so this way we can make the loader uh, thread safe. So the code looks something like this. So the reason I called it the context dict is context dict is you can use Tornado's stack context thing, which is pretty awesome. So at the stack context, what you can do is say, um, anytime you're inside of this call, I would like you to override, call this method effectively, right? So we'll overload it. So what this means is like in this context dict, I create the thing, foo equals bar, so it's just a dictionary, right? You get bar back, it's awesome. Um, inside of this context though, um, Right, it's still, it's still bar, but I can override it, and now it's foo, or baz, whatever it was, baz, I can't read my own writing, uh, which is on a computer, so that's sad. Um, then you leave the context, and everything's back to normal, which is awesome. And this works in parallel, so you can have a thousand of these code routines going, they can all do whatever it is that they want with their things, and then once they're done, you don't have to worry about these races. Um, so there's, a, there's actually, all the examples are in the tests, so feel free and go there. You can, it's, it's thread safe, coroutine safe, I can't think of any more ways to break it. So if you can, great, please let me know and we'll fix it. Um, so with this, you can now the loader, the objects that you get back, under salt, under whatever, they're all thread safe, coroutine safe, which is awesome, unless people have done things inside their modules which aren't thread safe or coroutine safe, which is not my problem. <laughs> right. Um, um, so the deadlocks problem is the other big problem that we have. Thankfully, we haven't really run into this problem yet. Uh, knock on wood, I hope this is wood, maybe not plastic. Um, we'll probably run to this at some point. In general, in SALT, we kind of get away from this since um, the different jobs that are running don't really have anything to do with each other. They just, you get a job, you do your thing, and you return, so there's not a whole lot of coordination amongst them. Uh, so for now, that's been okay. Uh, but we'll probably run to them at some point, so if you're gonna be mucking around in this sort of stuff or concurrent programming in general, watch out for these. When stuff's waiting on other stuff, especially if there's more than one lock, because that always ruins everything. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind with all this concurrent stuff is that it's not just down here in the transport layer or just inside salt. There's, there's concurrency at like all sorts of layers of your data center. So one of the common ones we ran into, well, thought through, we didn't actually have the problem, thankfully, <laughs> was uh, automated high state enforcement. We actually wanted to go and make our entire infrastructure run high state all the time. That way if someone logs in and mucks with the box or the box was dead for a while, um, it'll just run the high state and everything's great. The issue is you have to think about, does it matter like if all of your database hosts run high state at once or your web servers or your cache boxes or your edge boxes? 
And the answer is probably no. You probably don't want all your web servers running high state at once because they'll restart all at once, which is not cool. Um, so a pretty simple solution to this, which I've pushed in or earlier this uh, last year, was a ZK concurrency module and state. So what you can do is just wrap a specific section of SLS uh, of state runs inside of this lock. So basically for this guy, I'm saying before you're gonna go restart traffic server, make sure that you have a lock and you can control how many of them get it, whether they're ephemeral or not and that sort of thing and release it at the end. Um, now this does require Zookeeper, but you know you get the idea if you wanna write it on top of whatever your other thing is. Apparently the thing now is SQLite, that's what everything's written on now. <laughs> We've got all sorts of cues and things in it. Yeah, so you, you know, feel free and go there. But just keep in mind as you're going through this stuff, concurrency is not just inside salt, it's everywhere. Um, so what's some future stuff we can do with this stuff? So um, in the transport stuff, I'm working on some of this failover group stuff. So we already cleaned up the multi-minions so they don't have to have all these threads all over creation. There's some plans to basically make it so that you can have groups of masters that you can talk to and fail over between them. So you can have multiple groups that you'll fail over between. So that's pretty easy to do in this sort of thing. Um, we're, we're, I'm still working on this e, uh, better high availability for the master stuff. We've got it down to the point where you can have the multi-masters and syndics and it's all wired up and everything works great. But there's a lot of people that do weird stuff with masters. So if you do something which you think is weird, or maybe I shouldn't say weird, if you think it's innovative, please put something on that issue and let us know what you're doing so we'll probably not break you. Um, as far as the concurrency stuff, there's lots and lots of stuff to go in the concurrency world. So basically, today we've just done the transport stuff, but there's all sorts of other things there, like all the AXT pillars and the file routes fetching. Um, uh, one thing I was thinking about was some concurrent, uh, partially concurrent state execution, right? Like downloading all the files before you run the whole state tree, so you don't have to download all the files in serial. And then all sorts of other things can be coroutined instead of all this wild true and sleep stuff like reactors and engines and beacons. And I just added thorium on there because I learned about that yesterday. Uh, more wild trues and sleeps, don't do that. Um, yeah, and so that, that's the deck. Uh, any questions? Right, so the question is, uh, I mentioned this about supporting multiple transports, is that in there today? And the answer is yes. As of 2015-8, I believe is when we got, that got in, there's a transport underscore opts section where you can basically specify the name of a transport and then any options that you would like to override for that transport. Um, so you can... Right, so that way you can have, like, let's say the regular transport says 0MQ, inside of that transport ops, I could say TCP and then set a different port and then I could maybe make my own awesome one that goes over text messages and phones and stuff and like give it another port or something. Yeah, so that's all supported in there today. But beacons and reactors and stuff, that's not in 2002. Right, right, so the, the beacons and reactors and stuff, uh, this is, or this, specifically talking about the stuff we can do to make them more concurrent, see, concurrent friendly. Right now, beacons and, and uh, thorium are basically, let's go make a process and then let that process do things. And so it basically means that every single one you're running is a new process which can't coordinate with other things. Will they still work if you're using Tornado versus? Yes, so they're, they're, they're not zero MQ and now. Right, so yes, you can, so the question is, could you turn off zero MQ and use TCP now or vice versa. Yes, you can do that today. Uh, all these things about you know reactor engines, beacons, and those sorts of things, haven't done stuff with this yet, untouched. Uh, the other thing I wanna make sure that is clear, uh, it seems to be a common misconception, the tornado stuff has nothing to do with the transport stuff. The transport stuff just uses the tornado stuff. It is not a tornado transport, it's a TCP transport that just so happens to use tornado for all their concurrency stuff. So you'll, uh, in 2015-8, you get Tornado, so, you, so we are using that for a bunch of internal things, but you, know, you don't have to use TCP to get it. Uh, the zero-MQ stuff is actually implemented using Tornado as well. Is yeah. LinkedIn using the TCP right now? So the question is, is LinkedIn using the TCP stuff now? The answer is no, but not because of problems with the TCP thing. <laughs> Uh, we got it into the virtual environment and some staging stuff, and then there was unrelated issues, and the, the group that pushes that hasn't gotten back to it yet, sadly. Uh, I know there's a couple other people that have been using it that I've talked to on IRC at some companies that probably don't want to be named, um, but so there are people using it, and it's been stress tested quite a bit, so. 
right the, the the question is are we planning on like changing the you know that and yes the the current thinking is we'll probably switch the default at some point to the tcp transport off the zero mq transport since we don't have backwards incompatible version bumps that's get that gets dicey we'll figure that out yeah Right, so the question is, um, are the, uh, uh, what do they call them, uh, connected events, uh, will, you know, when a committee disconnects or connects other events, how does SALT use that sort of thing? I believe we added events into those sorts of things now. Uh, there's this whole subsystem, which I can't remember the name of, which is pres presence, um, and the TCP one is just more accurate at it. <laughs> um, so there's some talks about cleaning that up, so that, because the zero MQ one is basically a guess of what we think is present, and the TCP one can be what exactly is present. So, but yes, there are events and stuff fired for that. Any other questions? Everyone's sufficiently fallen asleep. Does the, does the minion listen on any ports now because of TCP, or is it the same way now where he does no listening and just connects back? Right, so the question is, uh, do, are the minions listening on any ports? Are they just connecting? And the answer is no, they're just connecting like they were before. Um, now, with the modular transport, you can make something like that. Right? You just have to implement a couple classes, and you're ready to go, and you can do whatever you want. Because from Salt's perspective, we're not saying that you have to connect or you can't, they have to listen or whatever. We're just saying, we're going to call you with this thing, and you must get that message to some place. So, but you, you know, so we can still do those sorts of things. There's some talks that, we were ha that I was having before with uh, maybe making a UDP-based transport for lossy networks, um, basically like bringing rate back, but inside, as a module inside of this. Um, so we'll see where that goes. So the question is, have we thought about using something exotic like SCTP? Um, yes, but no. Like we've thought about it, but uh, I needed something that works now. So we'll, we can, we, the thing is right now it's all modular, so pull requests are welcome. Signed up. We'll, we'll follow up with you next year. <laughs> all right, I think we're, Maybe out of time, yeah. So feel free to go. I'll be here if you want, if you have questions or whatnot. <laughs>